Hello and welcome. Today we're talking to Stan Mazai. Stan comes out of Phoenix, Arizona. He's got tremendous experience in the aftermarket and parts business. He's run his own business for more than 22 years in parts supply and aftermarket fitment and repair of vehicles. He has developed two apps, one called Parts Pass and the other one Parts Detect. They have more than a million SKUs of parts which they supply through these apps and they've got warehouses across America. So we're going to be talking to Stan today about what's happening in the aftermarket market and part side of the business. Let's jump into it. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Dan, thanks very much for joining us today. To kick things off, can you tell us about the two apps you've launched? Absolutely, John. Great to be on the show. Thanks for the opportunity. My first venture, Parts Detect, vehicles brought into the shop. One of the biggest problems that I faced was sourcing replacement parts. So at the time, mobile apps was growing significantly and we had an opportunity to build something that wasn't available. And what that was, was a marketplace for automotive professionals to search multiple parts suppliers and place an order directly from the app for any one of those various suppliers that we have. I calculated the amount of time that I was spending searching and procuring parts and it was equivalent to over 45 thousand dollars a year that I misspent by just sitting on the phone calling supplier after supplier. So that was for the the B2B sector of it. In early 2022, we wanted to bring the same user experience to the do-it-yourselfers. A similar problem that do-it-yourselfers faced, which was I need a replacement part. I don't know who has a quality part. Sometimes I'll go down to my parts house. Sometimes I'll go online. So we started Parts Pass as a search engine that everyday people, do-it-yourselfers, can use to search and order parts successfully. What sort of age group of cars do you look at? Is it cars over 10 years old? We have parts that are available for vehicles that go back to the mid 70s. And that's for the do-it-yourselfers. With the the business to business with the parts detect, we have databases that go back to the early 60s. So how does it actually work? How how do you make sure he's got the right model car and that he orders the right part? It, It is one of the biggest problems that people who are searching for parts face, which is fitment. And we've been doing this for over seven years now. So we have quite a bit of experience. We have back-end catalogs that cross-reference certain parts. With the Parts Pass app, we wanted to take it one step further, and we actually embedded artificial intelligence into the application. And what's really neat there is that we give the user an opportunity to take a picture of their vehicle. It can be the back of the vehicle, it can be the front of the vehicle, or the side of their vehicle. Picks up the dimensions of that vehicle and helps alleviate that process of knowing what vehicle you're working Every now and then, on a small percentage, the system will ask the person to clarify maybe a year or an engine size because some of the things you just can't know just from the outside of the vehicle. So we took that one step further and we also give the user a drop down menu option as well. So if the vehicle is not in front of you, if it's not present, whether it's in your garage or you're at home, we have another opportunity to allow people to manually select the year, make, model and engine size. And if someone's based out of Australia, could they use your app to order a part or is it just for the US? So we're focusing currently just in the U.S. The plans to expand into Canada and Europe. Australia is definitely on the market. It's just the way that vehicles are decoded are just a little bit more complex. So for every new country that we start working with, their vehicle identification numbers are different from what we have in the U.S. But I think the important part is to get the right part because if you, you can't source a part. Absolutely. That's one of the biggest headaches that people face, which is figuring out which vehicle you're working on. And artificial intelligence is getting extremely smart on a day-to-day basis. So we look at it as an advantage to simplify a problem that hundreds of thousands and millions of people face every single day. Because you're starting to get cars are actually printing parts so they can print in metals and alloys. We've been speaking to a company that for parts that are no longer manufactured, that they are able to print the parts. I agree with you. It, it's, it's about that time that it becomes mainstream as opposed to maybe just a handful of companies that have the technology to 3D print. I think it's a necessity, but I I've seen the capability that they have, and it's definitely something that is just mind-blowing. So where do you see the future of parts going? What do you think is happening in the industry? I I feel like the automotive industry overall is there's so much improvement that can be made over the next few years. 
years. Uh, but what's interesting more is the fact that people are holding on to their vehicles longer than ever before. Here in the States, the average vehicle on the road is 13 and a half years old with over 125,000 miles. And leasing is going down. New car sales are going down. Manufacturers of these automobiles are removing certain models from their production line. And what we're seeing now is that influx in vans, pickup trucks, and, and really heavy duty vehicles. So it's really interesting to see where that market is going now that you have artificial intelligence and you have self-driving vehicles. But I think that the automotive industry, this, specifically the service side of things, will continue to, to grow. Aftermarket parts, OEM parts, I think that will always be something that people hold on to because people want their own vehicle. They want their quote unquote independence that they can just get in their car and go for a cruise and keep their gym bag in the back or a yoga mat and not rely on a on-demand service or a subscription-based model. In the warranty period, it used to be three years in most countries and then it went to five years. I think in Australia, it had sitting around the seven-year mark. Are you seeing the same thing in the US and how does that impact the different type of businesses? I think, I think that there's a lot of competition now between manufacturers because you have a, a car like a Hyundai that has a 10-year, I believe, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty where you have Ford that can't match that. But when we're talking about warranty, we're talking about the drivetrain, the engine and transmission mainly, right? And those outlast the expectations that manufacturers give them. When we're looking at also OEM parts, typically you get a 12,000 mile, 12 month warranty. Whereas aftermarket, the auto zones of the world, the Napa auto parts, some of those parts built just as well come with a lifetime warranty. Buy it one time and we'll guarantee it for life, right? So I think OE is having a really hard time because people are getting a little bit smarter when they're shopping for replacement parts. They're comparing apples to apples and they're seeing what the best value is. A vehicle is the second largest purchase a person can make. So it's only natural that they're going to start asking questions as opposed to saying, okay, let me just give you, you know, the credit card and charge it for whatever it may be. So there's an opportunity for aftermarket auto parts to come in aggressively and provide that warranty, knowing that a person will hold on to that vehicle for maybe five to seven years before they pass it along to somebody else and buy themselves a different vehicle. So that's where I see an opportunity, but at the same time, a challenge for the OEM manufacturers. Also seeing electric vehicles coming in, and that's going to have a quite an impact on the parts business. How is that going to impact part sales? Electric vehicles are still pretty mature. I think the idea, the concept is absolutely needed. We need to drastically decrease emissions. There's just too much traffic, too much pollution. But I recently saw a video and it was on the Joe Rogan podcast about cobalting, which is what it takes to provide these large lithium batteries. And it was heart-wrenching to see this mine in the middle of Africa. And they just had people working in their flip-flops. And this is the only mine that has this cobalt mineral. And that's where they extracted from. So I think once this made headlines, people started really reevaluating the EV market because initially they are, you're going into it thinking that you're making a difference. You're, what it's showing is that it's complete opposite. There's a lot of improvements that are needed in the EV space. On the verge of purchasing myself an EV vehicle, but let's be honest, I, I like that internal combustion engine. I like the power. I like the, the engineering that goes into an automobile. So for me, EVs, is, they're great, but they're still premature. I think that customers are also pushing back and they want to see a difference, a different approach into it. From a dealer perspective, so you think long term it, it's going to have some impact? I think there's going to be a huge impact in the service industry when EVs become more mainstream because there are certain computers that are needed to diagnose these vehicles. You can't just retract a caliper. You need a computer for it. So traditional mom and pop shops, unfortunately, are going to be faced with a, with a decision either to step up and educate themselves or they're going to be left in the dust, unfortunately. And Stan, in terms of parts sustainability. Where do you see that impacting parts and parts supply? I help but to think back to uh, the pandemic and what it's taught us. I think that there was a big lesson there about uh, dependency and independency. Looking at the manufacturers and the parts sourcing that goes into it, parts are sourced throughout the world and foreign affairs are getting that much more complex. So you, you really have to rely on a quality provider that has the, the capability of providing these replacement parts or more 
more and more parts are going to become scarce, which are going to make it even that more impossible for people to service vehicles. So hopefully back to what we were talking about earlier, where you have the 3D printing, I think that will be a huge opportunity for the industry. What are your predictions for the future in the industry? I believe that people are always going to hold on to their own vehicles. I have a number of vehicles myself. I alternate throughout the weekend. Every weekend, I take out a new car and just kind of cruise around. But again, I'm a car enthusiast myself. There's the opposite to that, which is I just need to get to work. I just need to get from point A to point B. And I think that the subscription-based model for autonomous vehicles are here, and now they're only going to grow. Uh, we see it in California. We see it here in Phoenix, Arizona. So I think that the subscription-based model, similar to what an Uber on-demand minus the Uber driver, will be mainstream here in the next couple of years. I, I see Tesla as well, given an opportunity to Tesla car owners, the opportunity to monetize off of their vehicles. For example, if I own a Tesla, I drive myself to work for eight hours, I work, and the vehicle actually goes out and becomes a livery or a cab, right? So it'll pick up passengers, drop them off. So it'll work for a good six to seven hours. And then once it's time to go home, it comes back to my office, picks me up, and then we drive home. So now you're creating a business for yourself. Can you tell us more about the autonomous vehicles? In Australia, we're seeing a lot of subscription and car share. That's been happening for 10 years, but we haven't really seen many autonomous cars actually operating on the road. How does it work at the moment? It's it's picking up. It's trending. People are downloading the, I believe, the Waymo app and trying to get an experience out of it. Currently, the vehicles that are being offered is a Chrysler minivan. There's a, a Jaguar SUV and a couple other cars, probably been five plus years since they actually hit the road here in Phoenix, Arizona. And every single time that I drive by in downtown Phoenix, I see a vehicle that's Waymo and has the uh, sensors around it, two on the bumper, two on top, and then two on the rear bumper. And they're just constantly spinning and absorbing all the information. But they always have a driver present. I'm excited for it. I think it gives people the opportunity to stay working, especially if you were commuting for 30, 40 plus minutes, you want to use your time well. So if it's not an audio book, I am uh, either on the phone or with meetings or doing something productive. And those cars are driving in normal everyday traffic or they're driving according to certain routes. The most challenging part is that the road conditions. So in, I believe, San Francisco, the, the dividers, the line, the paint on the, on the roads is deteriorating. So the system can't pick up where the lines are. Uh, whereas here in Phoenix, we have some really clean roads, new roads as well. So the system can pick up the intersections, the lines on the road. But for some territories or rural areas, I don't believe that the vehicle can make it there. Correct. And apartment complexes, I believe, is also a challenge for them because they can't distinguish unit numbers. It'll pull up to your apartment main entrance and just ping you and say, hey, we're outside. It's going to create significant change because, as you say, you don't need as many vehicles. It's about time that our vehicles start communicating with each other, especially if you're taking the same route every single day. It would alleviate the traffic, the congestion, if vehicles can just communicate with each other. And I see that's where the future is going as well. And then going back to parts, how long are parts lasting now? Because you talked about the lifetime warranty. Where do you see that going in the future? The cost of parts has gone down over the past few years, but now they're starting to creep back up because supply is, is limited. The chain has been disrupted. Part sourcing, whether it's come from China or somewhere from Asia, it's getting that much more difficult. So manufacturers are looking for new plants throughout the world. And I believe the statistic is that India is going to be the next booming economy because a lot of the manufacturers from China are moving over to India and scattering throughout the world. It's beyond me how these manufacturers can offer lifetime warranties. I believe that they have some sort of an equation where the cost of acquisition to the lifetime value of a customer is X. Therefore, if they buy this part, chances are it's not going to fail. Or if it does fail, then we know that they're a repeat customer going off of the average purchase order number of a customer. But I think it might be a marketing advantage for them as well to really pinpoint that, hey, we'll give you a lifetime warranty and just drive into us because chances are they'll have to buy coolant or additional fluids that we have a higher markup profit margin. So that way we can give them that thermostat or that housing at a lifetime warranty because if it does fail, chances are they'll have to come back and buy another gallon of antifreeze or another five quarts of oil. So I'm sure that, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it might have been more of a newer trend in the last decade as opposed to what we've seen in the last 20 
years because they've already figured out the total addressable market. They figured out what their lifetime value is of a customer. So for them, it's beneficial to offer this as opposed to potentially lose a customer. For me, it doesn't make sense because it's not original equipment. The standards are a lot less when you're talking about aftermarket auto parts as opposed to original equipment because they have higher standards. Going into the service side of things, when we install parts, it's one of the things that I communicate with our customers as well that we'll put on this part. It's a lifetime warranty. If it just so happens to fail, we'll give you the part at no charge, but we'll charge you for the labor claim, right? So people like to hear that, even though I think people hold on to their vehicle just over four and a half years, and then they just sell it, move on to the next one. But it's nice to know that you have a lifetime warranty, especially if the part is like an alternator or AC compressor, where it's a few hundred dollars and it's not cheap. And if it goes bad in the first two years, you know that you have a warranty. But there's ways to get around that because these manufacturers are no fools. Now you have to ship that part back to them. They have to disassemble it. They have to see what the fault was. And if it's their fault, then they'll give you the, the refund. But if it's not, then you're going to have to buy a new one. Imagine it takes quite a bit of time. So you've got a vehicle disabled in your workshop that takes up space. You know, what do you do with these three or four vehicles where you ship the parts back to the manufacturer, waiting for them to do the analysis? Yeah. So when we purchase parts, again, I want to go into it with quality and availability and warranty. So those are the key things that I offer my customers, knowing that they're going to get the best service, they're going to get the best price structure, best product with the best warranty. Um, and that's kind of what we rolled into the parts pass business model, really focusing on what, what the problem is, where the, the most friction is. So we kind of focused on the friction, the bottlenecks that people had to go through and continue to go through. And we created a solution around that. And are you seeing much in terms of remanufactured plots or used plots? Uh, do you see much of that happening in the US? It, it's a huge market and it's continuing to grow, I believe, 4% year after year here in the US. Again, people are holding on to their vehicles a lot longer. And when a part fails, the mindset is this part has been in my car for a number of years, let's say 10 years, and it just failed, right? I want to get a compatible part that's original equipment because probably it's going to last me another 10 years as opposed to going to aftermarket at the local part supplier. So I'm going to go and source it as a used part. I'll get a 90 day warranty on it. But in the back of my head, if I got 10 years out of the first part that failed, chances are I'll get another six to seven years in the part that I just purchased from the local wrecking yard, but it's original equipment part. And we're seeing a lot of the insurance companies actually nowadays that are allowing service stations like me to install used parts. They're not going to go in there and say, okay, you know, the AC compressor failed. You can get it from Napa Auto Parts. It costs, you know, $700 for a new compressor. They're going to say, okay, Napa is too expensive. We found that at the Arizona Collision Center for $80, it's original. They'll give you a 90 day warranty. And customers have no idea because they're like, hey, I was under the impression that insurance companies would step in and give me a brand new part. But that's not the case. Nowadays, they're saying, no, you need to install a cheap part. And in terms of remanufactured engines, where do you see that part of the market? Honestly, I've been in the industry for 17 years and I've probably sold two brand new engines remanufactured completely. People don't rebuild engines. There's there's a wide range of low mile used engines at the wrecking yard that you can buy for, depending on the car, let's say a Honda Civic for 400 bucks and it'll cost you another six, seven, 800 bucks to install it, right? You got under $2,000, you got another engine swapped in within three days. To remanufacture one, you got to go into the whole process of sanding down the heads and doing pressure testing and everything that comes with it. They don't want to invest that kind of money into their vehicle because they're probably going to change in the next couple of years. And they don't want to invest that kind of time into it because let's be honest, three day turnaround versus a possibly two to three week turnaround it just doesn't make sense. I know that there's large companies that are making tons of money selling brand new engines for thousands of dollars and there's a market for it. Again, I know my addressable market here in Phoenix. People just want to get back on the road. They want to get the best price that they can and they want to get good service. Now, some of the auto manufacturers sometimes run a remand program for their own brand. What happens is if the customer has this particular engine, he has to return that engine, but they have one that's already been remanded. So the turnaround time can be still the same. But that's more for a gap between the brand new engine and the remand engine and then there'll be a used engine. So I think it falls a particular part of the market. And I think if you're IEM brand, you could probably do it, but it may not be worth in any other situation. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, regardless, you're going to have to transfer over all the parts, right? You, you're getting a brand new uh, cylinder head and then transfer all the parts over, or you're getting an engine that has a thermostat engaged, which you probably want to change, and all the other components that come with it. I think that they might honestly have a challenge over the next five to seven years these brand new engine manufacturers or direct replacements.
Since we launched the Parts Pass app, we've been growing very aggressively. We have quality name brands. And are you integrated to those parts systems? How do you know if they've got stock available or what the pricing is? We have 27 warehouses throughout the country and over 2 million SKU numbers. Uh, we get live feed of inventory control. We know what we have in stock and we know what parts we have in stock. Not to mention the, the expedited shipping will get you the part within two days. A lot of the enthusiasts we speak to, that's the biggest challenge is finding the parts. And they're not available in Australia. Are they normally going online and trying to source them out to the US? Currently, we're focusing on the automotive industry with hopes and goals to branch into light duty, heavy duty vehicles vehicles, tractor trailers for the farming industry, ATVs for terrain vehicles, and expanding our catalogs for the parts sector as well. We're looking to work with original equipment manufacturers here in the U.S. and working with their APIs. So that way, we have an extensive catalog system. Have you seen that on Deere? There's been a court case that now allows on Deere farmers to service their tractors and their equipment. Yes. So I don't think it's happened in Australia yet. I think it will happen. Traditionally, the original equipment manufacturers used to see aftermarket as the enemy mm -hmm. but i think they've started to realize there's a big opportunity to if you get the guys on your side and they come and buy parts from you is you can sell a lot of parts into that market I agree with you. There, there's opportunities for dealerships, OEM part suppliers to really make a difference. And what I mean by that is not too long ago, I went into a local Ford dealer who expressed to me that they are now offering customers aftermarket auto parts, meaning that when a customer comes in and they have an alternator that needs to be changed, the service advisor will say, here's an original equipment Ford at this price, or you can have an aftermarket one a little bit discounted, but here's the price for that as well. So when you give that opportunity to to the customer and say OEM or aftermarket, OEM is just a little bit more, but you know it's original. Chances are they're going to go with OEM. But when you say it's either this or nothing at all, well, now there's resistance there. And from a consumer side of things, you know, you're challenging me to think about everything else that could have gone wrong, meaning that you're not giving me options, right? We come from a world of the internet where we have information everywhere we go. I've always felt like dealerships should give options to customers. Let them choose. You're still getting the, the labor installation, right? Maybe the part is coming from an outside source, so be it. You're installing something and let the customer sign off, but you're not responsible for that part. But you could be offering the same service and your app by being linked to the original equipment card. Exactly. Especially for the older parts, seven years and older. Yeah, we're, we're focusing on the top 10 vehicles and the top 10 parts that are replaced here in the US and giving quality parts as opposed to something that's just $5 cheaper or $10 cheaper. We're coming in very aggressively with the price structure and we're also coming in aggressively with parts quality. All of our parts are name brand Hitachi, Bilstein's, Denso, Motocraft, as opposed to what you see, you know, other suppliers online that are selling. You mentioned India as the next big market. Another big market is Africa. Mm -hmm. And we interviewed someone, they're setting up big automotive factories in Central Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and both from UCAR and from parts perspective. So they've got 10, 15 of the big automotive parts brands are going there. Market's huge because I think for every, thousand people in Africa, only 19 own a vehicle. I hope that the quality from the original manufacturers won't plummet, but on the up hand, just increase. In terms of quality in it, I know South Africa and Morocco have very big automotive manufacturing facilities, and the quality is pretty good coming out of there. Dan, thanks very much for joining us today. Great to have you on. I think we covered some pretty interesting topics. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thanks, John.